Welcome to the Travel Worth Living podcast. Our mission is to help aspiring travel content creators make a positive impact with the stories they tell. We do this by sharing the how and why of content creation through practical and inspirational stories. Hey, what's up, everybody? It is Seth here. Uh, We just got back from a lovely vacation to Denmark. Well, it wasn't quite a vacation. We were there for a wedding, but uh, had an incredible time walking around Copenhagen, seeing the sights, enjoying the sun, finally getting some sun and warmth. It was incredible. This week, though, uh, I'm really excited to to share this conversation with you. I was able to connect with Gary, and he is a legend in the travel blogger community. And of course, you know, travel blogger is the general overarching term, but it has evolved since it started in the travel blogging niche to now include travel content creators, travel influencers. Uh, we use Instagram, TikTok, whatever, but kind of the term, he's more old school, so we refer to it a lot as travel blogging. Uh, But this week we dive heavily into the why of travel content creation with travel blogger turned full-time podcaster now, Gary Arndt. In 2007, he sold his house and has been traveling the world ever since. Well, that is until COVID hit. During our conversation, he shares how he got into travel and how he was able to afford traveling full-time. We discuss how travel blogging has evolved over time as new technology and new apps have become available. Near the end of the episode, we also speculate about what the future of travel content creators will look like. I was honored to have Gary on the show as he has done more things and been to more places than most people will ever get to experience. Seriously, go look up Everything Everywhere, that's the podcast he runs currently, everything-everywhere.com, and go to the About Me section and just read about all his accomplishments. It's insane. So many stories. His unique perspective on travel content creators, the travel industry as a whole, and uh, whether over-tourism is actually a problem was absolutely riveting. You'll definitely want to hear as we talk about over-tourism, because that's that's a problem that we've had here in Iceland, or so I thought. Stay tuned for more on that. For travelers wanting to create a successful business, he also shares how to grow your audience and set yourself apart online. There's honestly so much packed into this conversation, so... Without further ado, here is my conversation with Gary. Welcome to the Travel Worth Living podcast. Super excited to have you on. And man, I was just looking over your about uh, about page again, and you have just had so much experience in life. And I'm so excited to have you on the show. So welcome. Thanks for having me. I just want to start, uh, again, Travel Worth Living is focused on travel and specifically full-time travel, travel as a lifestyle, and that's kind of what you started doing. So kind of tell me how you got into that. What what kind of built up to the point where you started traveling full-time? Uh, growing up, I never really traveled that much. We didn't have a family that traveled anywhere uh, outside of a trip, you know, when I was very young where we went to Niagara Falls and we drove through part of Canada. That, that's really my only experience ever being outside of the United States. I had a internet company that I started in the 90s. I had a very, I was at the right place at the right time. I started that, grew the company to about 50 people, and I sold it in 1998. And it was a big uh, global company that I sold it to. And I convinced them to send me on a trip around the world to their offices to talk about internet stuff. And they agreed to it. So I went on a three-week whirlwind tour. I went to Tokyo, Taipei, Singapore, Paris, Frankfurt, Brussels, and London. Talked to people at these offices, which actually didn't take that much time, and spent most of the time just sort of seeing everything. And it was a great experience. I did a couple international trips after that. I went to Iceland and to Argentina for a uh, a research project because I went back to school, studied geology and geophysics for a couple years. And I didn't kind of know what else I wanted to do at the time. I was in my mid-30s. And I just came up with this idea of traveling around the world. I enjoyed traveling. I had no kids. I had no wife. I had some money saved up. There was no reason I couldn't do it. So I did. And uh, it took me a while to to tie up loose ends, to sell the house. And in uh, March of 2007, I turned over the keys to my home and started traveling full time. I thought it would be a year or two. It ended up being close to a decade that I was on the road full time. Give me a quick synopsis of 
uh, of some of the I, I can't think of the word not necessarily records um, but some of the accomplishments that you have done while traveling as far as how much you visited I've been to over 400 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. <clears throat> I've been to half of the sites in the National Park System. So there's 400 and I think it's 28 now. Almost visited all the national parks proper, the 63. I only have a few more to go. And I would have done it last year if it wasn't for the pandemic. I've been to 130 countries, UN member states. I've been to 204 places on the Traveler Century Club list, all seven continents. I actually did that in a nine month period once. Yeah, I, I can't. I've tried to calculate the number of times I've actually circumnavigated the globe, uh, but I can't. I think it's like five or six. Yeah, and then I just, you know, it's all the other stuff in between. I got to do some very cool things. Uh, getting launched from a nuclear aircraft carrier was pretty cool. Dog sledding. Yeah, tell me. I, I want to hear more about that experience. What, what were you doing and how did you get that opportunity? Uh, the Navy has a program where they invite VIPs and journalists to come and visit an, an aircraft carrier. And they usually do it while they're training in the United States. Uh, they've done it in California, and I got to do it uh, in, uh, when the, it was in Norfolk, Virginia. And I got to visit the USS Harry S. Truman. Uh, we did a landing on the carrier, a tailhook landing. So they have these small thing. It's called an, uh, an A-2 Greyhound. And it's a small cargo plane that's used for flying to and from aircraft carriers. The wings fold up and everything. And uh, so we landed. We got to be on the deck of the aircraft carrier while they were doing landings and takeoffs. One of the most dangerous places in the world to be. I mean, if something goes wrong, it's, it's hundreds of millions of dollars of metal flying very fast, filled with fuel, and bombs. Uh, it, it's not a great place to be. It's, uh, but, but boy, it's, it's fascinating at how it all works, right? Everyone has a job. Everyone has a shirt with a color on it indicating what their duties are. And it, it, it's all, it all functions. We stayed overnight on the ship. And then the next day we, we were launched from the ship, uh, from the catapult. And that's the, the highest G forces I think I've ever experienced in my life. I almost blacked out. Um, very really? impressed at the pilots who can do this. Yeah, uh, you're you're facing the the passengers are actually seated backwards. So normally, when you're in a car and you accelerate, you you go back, right? So you get pushed back into your seat. But when you're sitting backwards, your body's going to go forward. So you have a four point harness on, and you have to tuck your arms under it because otherwise they'll fly out. And likewise, you have to put your legs up against the seat in front of you so they don't fly out and you're sitting there waiting for it to happen and you know it's going to happen and you know it's like ripping a band-aid off and then it happens and you're finally up in the air and you, you have um, goggles and you have protective ear stuff on and earplugs you can take that all off once you get up in the air and uh, this guy next to me was a <laughs> he was a retired admiral uh, who was with us he, he knew he knew everybody on the ship, and I said, ah, I almost blacked out. He said, so did I. Uh, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think he was a pilot uh, ever, and he, he certainly has done carrier landings and takeoffs, but um, it, it's something that unless you get accustomed to doing it, uh, that you just don't get used to. That is so fascinating. How many passengers were on the airplane? I'm not familiar with that aircraft. <sighs> Maybe like eight I want to okay. say it, so it fits like, I mean, it's not a, you're thinking of a cargo plane. It's not like a, a galaxy or something like that. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's designed for an aircraft carrier, so it's rather small. But it can, you know, show people back and forth. And what I found out being on the, on the ship is that, you know, the vast, there's 5,000 people working on an aircraft carrier. And most of them have never taken off or landed on a carrier. They, they simply, you can't transport 5,000 people that way. So they they have to wait till it docks somewhere, and then they you know climb on and off like every, like anyone else. So even for people who work on a carrier, most people don't get that experience. Yeah, that's incredible. Wow, what a rush! Speaking of yeah, launching from an aircraft carrier, I guess that kind of segues in. I'm just looking at your list of all the things you've done, and you visited an active war zone in Cambodia. Tell me about that experience. So that would have been in. 2008, 
I think. And the there's a World Heritage Site in Cambodia that is literally right on touching the border with Thailand. And traditionally, the visitors to this temple called Previere, uh, they always came from Thailand, not Cambodia, because on the Thai side of the border, there was a very nice paved road. And on the Cambodian side of the border, it was just a horrible dirt road. Well, 2008, it becomes a World Heritage Site. And, and I should say, Thailand and Cambodia have always fought over it. Not, not fought over it, but there's been a dispute as to who owns it. And it was recognized by, in the past, they had, you know, uh, people adjudicate the dispute. Cambodia was awarded to Cambodia. So when it was became a World Heritage Site, Thailand actually sent troops over the border to try to occupy it. And Cambodia obviously fought back. And I was in Cambodia when this was happening. And I wanted to visit because I visit World Heritage Sites. So I had this tuk-tuk driver in Siem Reap who I had hired for my time there. And I said, I want to go to Previere. And his eyes were like, really? I go, yeah. So we, we arranged. I paid him like 100 bucks. He got a motorbike for the day. And his dad was a cop in Siem Reap. And he gave him his gun. And he put the gun under the, the seat of the motorbike. So we go out to, to Previere, and it's a bunch of... We, we're, we, we arrive at the middle of the day. We left very early. It was about a seven-hour ride on the back of a motorbike. And my tailbone, to this day, still kind of hurts from that trip. Uh, it really just... The constant pounding. Because there's not much padding in the back of a bike. Uh, we arrive there in the middle of the day, and everyone's pretty much sleeping. It's, so, But what I found out when I got back is that there had been several soldiers killed, I think Thai soldiers, that were killed by a landmine, like, just after I left. So there was stuff going on, but it, they had a lot of propaganda signs up in English, so they were obviously not for, uh, you know, the local consumption. Uh, but on the way back, you know, we get caught in a rainstorm, and we kind of ride through it, and I don't know if, you know, if, if, you're, if you get wet and you're on a motorbike, you'll dry off pretty quick. But if you've ever been in a bathtub or a swimming pool too long, you know how your skin can get kind of wrinkled? Yeah. Well, the one part of you that doesn't dry off when you're on a motorbike is your butt. And yeah. my skin was so damp for a long time that it, it was becoming like wrinkled skin. And my ass was really starting to hurt. And I said, we got to pull over. I'm in pain. So we pull over and we pull over. This car pulls up and these guys start talking to Khmer. I have no idea what they're saying. They're talking to my driver, ba 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 ba. And while they're talking, my driver lifts up the seat of the motorbike where he had the gun. And he, he has his hand in there. And I don't know what's happening. And I don't know, maybe he name dropped his dad or something who was a cop, but they. Um, he eventually, they left, he put the seat back down, and he's looked at me and said, we have to go right now. So we got in the bike, and uh, we went back to see him reap. Oh, my goodness. That That's a little terrifying, especially when you have no idea what's going on, what they're talking about. I assume they stopped because I was there. Um, mm. They saw a foreigner. and So you've traveled all over. Have you what is kind of your process with picking up the language? Do you pick up words as you go there? Have you learned uh, that much of any language? Because you started traveling. You, yeah, I, I mean, before Google Translate. Uh, so. I, you, you learn a few words in everything, but the international language of tourism is English. So if mm. you know English, that's the one thing you really need to get around. Pretty much in every airport you'll go in the world, signs will be in English. I've yet to see an airport that, that that's not the case. Maybe there are small, you know, regional airports in some countries that are, that are not that way, but an international airport will always be in English. Likewise, major train stations and also uh, most hotels that cater to tourists. Because, you know, if someone from Norway is going to Vietnam, uh, no one in Vietnam is going to learn Norwegian and no one in Norway is going to learn Vietnamese. So you learn English, and that's kind of become the the lingua franca for for most of the world. Um, I've been in many places where children would come up to me and start talking to me. 
like I was in, um, uh, this was in Prambanan in Indonesia outside Yogyakarta. I was walking around taking pictures and all these kids were coming up to me and they wanted to get their pictures taken with me. And then eventually this adult walks up and he explains he's their teacher and he teaches English and they're there in a field trip. And what they were assigned to do was to start a conversation with people in English. And that's what they did. Uh, I was at a, uh, one of the, you know, one of the things you learn is that if you, if you want someplace with a clean bathroom and Wi-Fi, McDonald's always has it pretty much everywhere around the world. And I was in Luxor, Egypt and I was by myself. I had my laptop and, uh, these two <clears throat> teenage girls sit down at my table and they start talking and they just were like, yeah, could we practice our English? And I was like, sure. And they, we just had a conversation and, uh, people learn languages differently and the words you pick up may depend on the circumstances and whatnot. And, uh, so they just, you know, like, what is, they pulled the hair out of their, uh, head covering. It's like, oh, that's hair. Oh, this is your head. Uh, like, okay, okay. Um, but I've had, yeah, experiences like that in Japan, same thing, uh, where I've had school kids come up to me and they, they want to start practicing. So you, I think you should always learn, please, thank you. Hello, excuse me, things like that to at least show that you're making an effort, uh, anywhere you go. Um, but you know, I was in an island in Japan, Yakushima. It was a pretty remote island, and no one there spoke English. And it was, I went to the restaurant, and if you go to a restaurant, it's pretty obvious what you want, food. Yeah. And, you know, it was that time of night, and so they were like, okay, we'll, we'll get you something, and they got me the set meal, and it was one of the best meals I've ever had. I don't know what I ate, but uh, they got me food, and it worked. That's awesome. It's part of the experience, right? And I should also say, there will all, if you want to buy something, they will always find a way to make the, the transaction happen. Always. <laughs> and in especially in he areas that get a lot of tourists, especially the young kids, they may know how to speak at least you know basic things in an incredible number of languages. It, it, it's really uncanny where you see these eight-year-olds who can, you know say at least basic phrases in Spanish, Russian, Arabic, Chinese, English, and whatnot, because that's where they, they have all their uh, tourists from. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's what they're exposed to and, and what they can learn the easiest. Some, sometimes I wish I was a kid again, trying to learn Icelandic here in Iceland. It's so hard as an adult, especially when all I know is, well, know very well is English. It's so difficult. I didn't know you were in Iceland. Yeah, I'm actually in Iceland. I've uh, been here for two years. And you mentioned you were here in Iceland. Um, it's not that big of a country. So, yeah, we've probably been to all the same places. <laughs> yeah, I was there. So I was there in 2000. And I didn't get to do a ton. And then I returned a few years ago. I had an opportunity for a stopover from uh, flying from the U.S. to Norway. And so I took mm -hmm. the opportunity, and I stayed in Reykjavik a few days. Boy, has it changed. Um, Reykjavik was just kind of like a small town when I was there in 2000. Not a huge tourism industry at all. And when I went back and, and saw some of the places I originally went, I, I didn't even recognize some of them. And I just did kind of the golden circle uh, thing because it was a pretty short stay. I'd like to go back and actually drive around the whole island and, and see a lot more of it. I was astonished at how short of a flight it was uh, to go from like Boston or something to Reykjavik. It really didn't take that long at all. Yeah. Yeah. 2000, you were here pre-Justin Bieber. <laughs> no, I think it was um, Justin Bieber and then, um, of course, the volcano, a that kind of put Iceland on the map and made it a huge tourist destination. Um, but that brings up an interesting question. You've been all over the place. What have you seen as far as the impact of positive versus negative of tourism? Well, we've been able to run a uh, kind of an experiment over the last year. Um, a lot of these places that complain about tourists are very desperate to bring tourists back once they lost them all, uh, because that was their livelihood. That's what they made their money off of. I think it's an issue of 
how many tourists. I, and the problem with over tourism, I've always felt, isn't that there are too many tourists. It's that there are too many people at the same place at the same time. And the reason is because uh, a place becomes popular or they're aware of it, and so they want to go to that place. And the big problem is people are simply ignorant of most of the other things out there. If you ask most Americans to name a city in France other than Paris, they can't. I mean, they literally can't. Uh, maybe they will know Nice or you know Lyon or something like that, but I don't think they could get beyond one hand. And so they don't know about a lot of these things. Or they, you know, uh, popular culture, there are certain things that, you know, these, these images, a gondola in Venice, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, these type of iconic things. But, you know, the, one of the things I, I, I talk about is like an underrated destination is the city of Padua. Padua is a 20-minute train ride from Venice. Easy to get to, even if you're on a cruise stop. There's a lot of great stuff there. It has one of the biggest t uh, city squares in Europe. It has the oldest botanical garden in the world. It has the Scrivingi Chapel, one of the greatest works of art in Europe. It has an amazing cathedral, lots of stuff. And almost no one goes there because they want to see that thing. And, you know, I've had discussions with people. I, I've been to a lot of places in the Pacific. And I remember this one was like, oh, we're, you know, we're going to go to Bora Bora. I'm like, wow, there's a lot of, you know, different other places you know, in the Pacific, you can go up here, here, here. You could spend all this money if you want to get this experience. It's like, no, no, we, we're going to Bora Because they just had it in their mind. They saw the magazine article or whatever. They saw these bungles. And they had to go to that place. And they just didn't know about any place else. And they didn't want to know about any place else. I think that's the, the biggest thing is to get people aware that, you know, New York, Paris, London, they don't need more tourists. They really don't. And I've, and I've talked to people at the tourism boards for places like, you know, Visit Britain. Their whole job is not to get people to London. Their job is to get people out of London. 80% of the people who visit uh, Great Britain go to London and nowhere else. And there are fantastic places, easy. I mean, it's a small country. You can get on a train in a few hours, you know, almost anywhere. For an American, it's, it's nothing. Um, and, and most people don't do it. You know, they just stick to one, one spot. Wow, that is... That is such a fantastic perspective on it. And I think you're spot on um, kind of what we've seen here in Iceland. Uh, what what really made it stand out to me, because some of the first times I came, the first time I came, I think, was 2017. Um, and we go to these popular these popular destinations like Cellulensfoss or Selfus, uh, the waterfalls, and you see all these Instagram pictures and it's just crazy, you know, nature. It's in incredible. And then you get there and you have to stand in line. <laughs> you know, there's, there's so many people packed up, uh, going to get this picture at the waterfall. And it got to the point where it's like, I mean, it's not even worth it. Iceland has thousands of waterfalls and you can go out into the highlands. You can even just go on the ring road into the West Fjords and there's nobody out there. There's no tourists out there. So yeah, exactly what you're saying. Well, the problem with Instagram isn't Instagram. It's that everyone, they see something. It's like, I must see that, right? And it's the same thing I said about the woman going to Bora Bora. They must see that thing that they saw and they're not interested in anything else or exploring or seeing what's out there or seeing what's new. And then they want to take the exact same picture that they saw on Instagram. And there's some great Instagram accounts that show like how everyone's taking the same photo, a picture of your feet outside of a tent, a picture of an illuminated tent under the uh, Milky Way. Um, there's that troll tongue place in Norway. There's, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the ones in Iceland. I see the same, I, I haven't even been to some of the waterfalls yet. I, I feel like I've been there because I've seen so many of the same photos and, um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's a lack of originality and a lack of just, you know, uh, curiosity that is driving people to go to the same places over and over. And I think this would be a good time to bring up, um, because a lot, a lot of it has to do with the algorithm, like social media algorithms. Um, for some reason, you know, if you have a curated feed, all the tones are the same, you get pictures that do well on other people's accounts, it's going to boost your pictures. And we were talking about this earlier as far as like blogging. How can we fight against that or kind of come up with a balance between, you know, being able to share our work? Because my audience is, you know, content creators. So people who 
travel and they want to share their experiences. They want to share their experiences with their audience to impact their audience, either um, to you know make them want to travel more or to highlight uh, issues that are happening on a global global scale. But you can't do that unless you have an audience. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that? I think if you want to really set yourself apart, you have to have some sort of interesting take or opinion. If all you're doing is chasing likes, you're, you're just going to get yourself to the same level as everyone else. It's all crabs in a bucket. And if you're taking the same photo that everyone else is taking, that, that's all it'll ever be, right? You, you're never going to get beyond that. By definition, doing what everyone else is doing is never going to set you apart from the crowd. You are the crowd at that point. If you're just doing the same that everyone's doing, and I've been, you know, I've been travel blogging a long time, uh, you know, since 2006, for 15 years now. And I, I'm still, I was in a clubhouse room the other day with some travel bloggers who I'd never heard of before, and they didn't know who I was. And the advice they were giving could have been ripped out of seven years ago. And it's just, you, you need to do something above and beyond if you want to separate yourself from the crowd. And you have to, um, you know, it's where you travel, the content you're creating, whatever. Uh, but if you're just doing the same photos, you know, if it's I'm in a sundress and a floppy hat in front of this place, or I'm wistfully looking in the distance while holding a cup of coffee with two hands, which nobody does, um, yeah, you know exactly the kind of photos I'm talking about. And yep. <laughs> so, okay, you're just another person posting the same crap on Instagram. That That's all you are. You That's all. And maybe it will get likes. I've noticed on my own account, <clears throat> I'm a pretty good photographer, right? I got the awards to, to, to prove it. And I know I can tell what photos will do well on Instagram and what won't. If it's a picture of mountains at sunset and certain landscape photos, those will always do better. People hit like on those. But if I post a picture, a great photo of a person, it's not going to do well because people don't click on photos of other people unless they know who that person is. So if you're an influencer mm -hmm. and you're constantly posting photos of yourself, which is what most of them do, it's all just a narcissistic mm -hmm. exercise in taking selfies. And for the record, I'd like to say in 15 years of travel, I don't think I've taken 15 photos of myself. <laughs> period because i am the least photogenic thing anywhere i am in the world i can always point my camera at something else and it will look better um <clears throat> to 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 do something more than that and i think that uh podcasting is kind of you know and, and video although then there too you're getting stuck into the youtube algorithms and what a lot of people don't realize is you can actually make a lot more money podcasting than you can doing video in the long run. The difference is mm -hmm. things cannot go viral in podcasting. Uh, there's not an algorithm you can crack uh, to get it to to get to that point. And so a lot of people, there's this guy I know is a very successful travel YouTuber, you know, getting millions, tens of maybe hundreds of millions of views monthly right now. And what he's making per month was like uh, twenty thousand dollars which is good, don't get me wrong. But I can do that with a fraction of the audience with a podcast than, I, than in YouTube mm -hmm. because your CPM rates are so much higher and you control everything. You're not, you know, you don't have Google taking a massive cut of it. Yeah. And I, I also think it's good because you're not chasing an algorithm. You're not trying to fit into whatever the algorithm wants in order to grow. You just have to have a good show. That's it. Yeah. I mean, there's no, uh, and, and it's a human voice you're listening to. I have, you know, I have big audiences on a lot of social platforms, but when I meet readers in person, the first thing they always mentioned was the podcast. You know, I've had a podcast for 12 years now, this week in travel and numbers wise, it had nothing to compare with the other things I've done, but people would always mention it first because that's how they knew me. They heard my voice. Mm -hmm. They could develop a bond with me that you can't do by looking at a picture on Instagram. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it, I, I love the, it kind of breaks down the barrier. You know, you can hide behind pictures. You can kind of hide behind YouTube. But for some reason, podcasting, when when they're in your ear, like it just feels like you're you're in the room talking to them, having a conversation. And that's what I love about it. 
Yeah, and and you can't really. I mean, you can do that on video. It depends how you do the video, and there's lots of different ways yeah. to do podcasts as well. But uh, yeah, they they can see who you are as a person. And I don't know if you've been on like Clubhouse or any of these social audio apps lately, but people behave differently. Uh, some of the worst places in the world are YouTube comment sections, like just a wretched hive of scum and villainy of people and, and the comments they leave. Several months on Clubhouse, everyone's been nice. Everyone behaves because you don't, you can't hide behind something anonymously. You have to use your own voice and you're talking to other people with a voice who you recognize as human beings and people don't behave that way. And <clears throat> I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, the fact that, you know, people can, uh, that it, it's increasing the level of civility, if anything else. Yeah, I love it. Since we're since we're kind of on this topic of uh, business, do you mind? Uh, and you mentioned your podcast, and and uh, the audience is is content creators who want to share their travel stories. Do you mind uh, going into your story a little bit as far as the podcast and how that came to be, and um, how you've been able to travel full time with that, or well, whatever <clears throat> other stuff you're doing? So I have two podcasts. This Week in Travel, I've been doing that since 2009. That has never made any money. We just ran our first ad like two weeks ago. Uh, but the, the, the intent was not to make money. We had three co-hosts. Uh, the purpose of the, you know, was to bring on notable people in the travel industry and to um, really kind of increase our profile. So this was back in 2009. It worked successfully. We had Samantha Brown on the show. We've had Pauline Fromer, a lot of notable people. <clears throat> the other show that I started uh, was Everything Everywhere Daily. I It's not quite a year old. It'll be a year next week on July 1st. And that was basically in response to the pandemic. Like a lot of people, you know, while traveling, I made money off the website. I did things with... Um, Tourist boards and travel brands, you know, post stuff to Instagram, do a guest post, stuff like that. I was never really thrilled with that as a business model, uh, but it allowed me to travel, which was my first concern at the time. When the pandemic hit last March, well, March 2020, uh, everything just fell apart. Uh, I never, in my wildest dreams, imagined the whole travel and tourism industry just sort of stopping. I mean, it's a very big industry, you know, globally. Yeah. And all the contracts I had disappeared. They got canceled. The tours I was going to run with readers got canceled. Traffic to the website plummeted. And moreover, people weren't buying anything anymore. So all my affiliate income went to zero. My uh, travel and uh, people in the industry weren't buying money, advertising and marketing anymore. So it was, it was really bad. And I started talking, I, I served on the board of the Society of American Travel Writers. I have a lot of contacts with people who are higher ups in different uh, travel companies and whatnot. And I started talking to some of them and it dawned on me because at the, at the time I thought, oh, this will be over in a few weeks. Yeah. We'll have a lockdown and <laughs> <We> then <all> <laughs> in April or May we'll be back to normal. And no, people were telling me like, no, you don't understand. This is, this is going to be really, this is going to take years to resolve itself. And, and that's kind of what happened. These, you know, the cruise companies, the airlines, the hotels were laying off people. They were mothballing ships and, uh, they were trying to stay alive. They weren't worried about spending money on getting customers because there were no customers. There was zero demand. And so I was like, okay, I can't even, you know, and there's this notion like, oh, okay, well, we'll get a vaccine. We'll all get our shots and then back to normal. No, even, even now that like half the country has been vaccinated, I have a Facebook group and people are traveling internationally and all the reports are, are how big a pain in the ass it is to travel because you still need to get testing done. The tests have to be done within a few days. It has to be a certain type of test. You have to ha show the test results in a certain language. One guy was in Mexico. He was going to go to Kenya, but it, his test was in Spanish and they wouldn't accept it. And it was just, just, it's just still a pain in the ass. And I was like, okay, I got to, I got to think of something. And so I had this plan a couple of years ago to launch a new podcast and I kind of put it on the back burner 
and I revived it, except instead of doing like a show of twice, you know, once every two weeks, I brought it back as a daily show. And it's not a travel show. It's a history show. And one of the things I've kind of come to realize is that you don't have to think, one of the problems with travel is that people only care about travel when it's time to go on a trip. In between that, they don't care about travel. Travel isn't something you follow every day, like politics or sports or technology or fashion or celebrity gossip. There's always something new happening, right? There's some political scandal. There's a new season in sports. There's a new iPhone coming out every year. There's always something new. There's nothing new in travel. We're not building new Caribbean islands. There are no more Roman ruins that are being created. It's there. Um, so it's something you may research before you're going to go on a trip, but you don't follow it. I have friends with very successful food and fashion blogs. They get way more traffic than I ever did because every day you're looking for a recipe to cook something. Uh, you may buy clothes, uh, every month, some people even more than that, but travel, not so much. So I decided I was going to do a, a history show. This puts me with one foot still in the world of travel, because a lot of the stories I talk about with are very related to destinations and are stories that I picked up from my travels, but it's not reliant upon the travel industry. And so one of the things that over the last year that I've come to, to change my thinking on is that travel is, you don't have to think of travel as a thing, as an industry, as a niche. Travel can be a wrapper that goes around other things. Anthony Bourdain wasn't a travel guy. He was a food guy. Every episode was about food, having dinner with people, right? And the travel was the wrapper for the discussion of food. Mm -hmm. The discussion of history or my podcast, you know, you can think of, I can still, I've I've worked with travel brands still, and I'm going to be running uh, tours for my readers because there's no better way to experience history than through travel. You can do that with sports. You know, you could visit golf courses, baseball, uh, or, uh, you know, ballparks, whatever. Uh, but you can think of travel as kind of an, a, just a layer to something else. And I think a lot of people may have more success by thinking of it in terms of that rather than the same people talking about points and miles. I mean, it's just only so much you can, there's only so many credit cards. There's only so many loyalty programs right? And yeah, they make periodic changes and upgrades to those things, but there's just, there's just so much you can talk about. And the other extreme is to just, to, to really be able to talk authoritatively about so many of these more obscure places in the world, you have to travel a lot. And most of the travel bloggers I know, they, they're been out for two years or so, and they've been to Bali and Chiang Mai and the same places that everybody goes. And they're not, you know, one of the the things I did when I started traveling is the first several months of my travels were in the Pacific Ocean. I was island hopping. I was going to places like Samoa and Tonga, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, places people don't go. And they still don't go. And that made me stand apart from your typical uh, backpacker that just stays on a backpacking trail. Yeah, so much good information in there to uh, kind of think about how has that kind of impacted your personal journey as far as learning, learning new things as you travel around the world and realizing that what you grew up doing may not always be the best way or the only way? That's kind of a broad question. but uh, uh, Learning is the reason why I travel at the end of the day. And that's why I always, you know, I, I visited all the World Heritage Sites and National Parks. The, and, you know, and most of the National Park Sites are not nature. They're historic. Yeah, uh, yeah. there's Yellowstone in Yosemite, but a lot of it is very small historic sites or battlefields or things like that. And Old forts. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I soaked a lot of that in, uh, in that I would really go out of my way to visit some of these places too, like in some cases way, way out of my way. And I think having that intellectual curiosity is really necessary because if you don't have that, then it's really just sort of a superficial process where it's just look at me. I'm on a beach in my glamorous lifestyle, even though I'm 24 years old 
and there's no way I can afford any of this. Um, but if, if you're just talking about the cool stuff and the story of this place that you visited, um, then I think that's far more interesting. Now, the problem is the number of people in this world who are intellectually curious is very small compared to the number of people who are shallow and vapid. Um, this is a hard lesson I had to learn over the course of you know doing this, is that there's a reason why reality TV shows are so successful. Um, and more people will watch reality TV than will watch a documentary. That's because you're dealing with a lowest common denominator. You're dealing with a reality TV show type intelligence and audience. It's not even intelligence. It's just that they have no interest in the rest of the world or how it works. And um, there's a large, and I, I, I began seeing this. So when I started, I had a pretty, you know, there weren't a lot of travel bloggers. There weren't, wasn't Instagram. And over time, I began to see people appealing to this lowest common denominator and doing really well. And it kind of bothered me at first um, because I can't do that. I just cannot bring myself to do that. I am also yeah. not the uh, cheerful, oh, yes, everyone, you know, rah, rah, I'm not your coach or anything like that. Uh, I'm, I'm more the, the drill instructor who's just going to kick you in the ass and say, do it. But it works, and it works for some people. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm one to say don't do it if that's what your personality is, but um, I think it's far more interesting to, to look at it intellectually than it is you know, socially or culturally or just through the number of likes. No, I 100% agree. And <laughs> yeah, no, the the whole reality TV thing is a perfect reality TV versus documentary is a perfect example. Reality TV is so shallow. It's so superficial. It's harmful to them because they feel so much public pressure and it's harmful to the public because why are they so invested in these people's lives? You know, they're not learning anything. They're not that's what, about. That's what most influencers are. They're basically taking a reality TV show approach by saying, look at my, I, I was in a trip to Sri Lanka once and there was an influencer from China. And we, you know, we can debate about the, what the meaning of the term influencer is as to whether I'm an influencer or not. Uh, but we were walking up this mountain and everyone that was with us in our group, we had like hiking boots or, you know, something that you would wear outdoors to climb a hill. She had an evening gown. And you you don't normally wear an evening gown when you climb a mountain. <laughs> to take pictures of her on the top of the mountain wearing this evening gown and presenting a fake, uh, not honest view of what the experience was like. Now, you know, if you're if you're doing a film shoot for an ad or a magazine cover, I get it. You know, that's, you're just looking for a backdrop and you have a very specific purpose in mind, but that's so much what it's become. And, you know, there's been so many stories about there about how fake it is and they create drama for the sake of drama and people get sucked into it. And I just can't, that, that, that's something I personally want. I don't want to be a part of. Yeah. And I love that we're talking about this because we have so many tools at our fingertips today. We have social media, we have podcasts, we have blogs, we have videos, um, we have so many tools, so we have no reason to to fall back into this fake influencer lifestyle, the typical you know bad rap that uh, it gets a lot of times because of those fake influencers. And I just love that we're talking about, and I love that I have you on the podcast. You know, travel is incredible. The things you feel, the things you see, the things you learn. Why can't we share that stuff instead of these copy pasted, picture perfect photos? that are unrealistic, like you said, you know, hiking in a dress, evening gown. The problem is there's demand for it. People clearly, mm -hmm. they, they, they consume this content. And then you have people in the travel industry who pay for this. You know, they will, they will sponsor these people and they will hire them for campaigns because of an audience. Not thinking, are, you know, are these people that really want to travel to this place? Because a lot of times they take a photo of themselves it doesn't matter where they are. It's just a background, right? That's all it is. It's it's a beach. It doesn't matter where that beach is. It's just a beach. Yeah. 
a mountain, a waterfall. And these people who are following them are not necessarily interested in travel. And the problem with the travel industry is that when they spend marketing money, travel is a very long sales cycle. So uh, Kylie Jenner can say, I buy this brand of lipstick. And the next day, there will be a spike in the sales of that brand of lipstick. A very clear, direct uh, result in product mention versus sales. Travel doesn't mm-hmm. work that way. If Kylie Jenner says, I'm going to Hawaii, the next day you will not see a spike in people going to Hawaii. Why? Well, it's expensive. It's not, a, it's not just buying lipstick. Second, it takes time. You're going to go there. You got to schedule time from work. You got to probably going to go with someone else. You got to arrange your schedules. Then you got to book a hotel. You got to figure out what you're going to do. You got to plan for it. And it may be years between when someone gets the idea to go to a place and when they actually end up going. And it's very hard to attribute where that sale came from or where the idea came from. And the person who went may not even know. And so it's mm-hmm. a very, it's a very challenging thing to do. So, and because a lot of them are also uh, tourist boards, which are government sponsored, and because they, and they don't have to show a profit, all they have to do is show their higher ups, we did this thing. And here are some numbers with this thing we did. And the numbers are large. Aren't, aren't we good people? You know, don't fire us. And so because they don't have to show any results to their campaign, you know, all they have to do is say, well, everyone else is doing this. And if everyone else is doing it, so I don't know if you remember, they got rid of it, but there was the CNN airport network and, uh, Mm -hmm. you always be on televisions and airports and they always had, most of the ads were like for these big national level destinations. You'd always see stuff like Seoul, the Seoul of Korea, or, uh, incredible India. And they would run there and they, these, um, national tourist boards were dumping all this money into things like the CNN airport network because they had to spend their money somewhere. And if you drop a million dollars on CNN, no one's going to raise an eyebrow. But if you spend $10,000 on some influencer, no one ever heard of, you know, they're going to be like, what, what's this? You know, what the, that, yeah. that will raise eyebrows. So your incentive is to always keep and And now I would say influencer marketing probably isn't going to raise an eyebrow, but, um, as so long as you just do what everyone else does, then then you're fine. And there was an old saying in, in IT, no one ever got fired by hiring IBM. And that's, you know, the goal for a lot of these people is to not increase sales because there are no sales to increase. The goal is to not be fired. And if you do what everyone else is doing and you just throw your money at newspapers and magazines, even though no one's reading them anymore, you will not be fired. I don't even know what the point of the rant is at this point, but um... <laughs> I, I love it though. And I feel like there's a recurring theme that is coming out, which is don't just follow the crowd. Don't do what everybody else is doing. It's safe to do that, but that's not going to be what makes you stand out and what makes you actually benefit society. Because there's one thing to actually be successful, get followers, make money. And there's another to actually be successful and impact people uh, teach them things, change them for the better. You do need a business plan. Um, but the, the, the reason why I'm so not high on blogging right now is because it's, it's SEO is a zero sum game. If I rank high for a keyword, you cannot, if I'm number one, you cannot be number one for that keyboard keyword. Only I can. And so it's crabs in a bucket. We're all trying to pull each other down. We're all trying to, to get out of the bucket. With a podcast, however, if someone listens to this show, they could listen to my show too. I mean, granted, there's a finite amount of time, but the average person will listen to seven or eight podcasts, the average podcast listener. So if they listen to your show, okay, that's one. Maybe I'll be number two, and maybe they have Joe Rogan or something else from NPR's, you know, another one. But... That, that's fine. It doesn't have to be as competitive because we're not trying to compete in an algorithmic sort of way. Exactly. I kind of want to dig into uh, a couple more of these stories because I love hearing stories. You're a great storyteller. You have so many from around the world. So if you don't mind, we've kind of hammered out the business side a little bit. Um, 
But could I ask you a couple more story questions? Yeah, go um, for it. I'm looking at your. I'm just looking at your list here. Uh, tell me about the time you were in Alexandria uh, diving at the Great Lighthouse. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned Luxor because my wife and I actually went on our honeymoon there. Um, so that was an incredible experience. But we want to go back because it was mainly honeymooning, and we spent just a day in Luxor, and I was just blown away. And so, oh, you got to spend Egypt, several days in Luxor. There's several huge yeah. temples. You know, the Luxor Temple itself, which is kind of like right in the middle of the city, uh, Karnak, which is huge, and then stuff just outside of town, which is enormous. Uh, but in Alexandria, so the the lighthouse, known as the Pharos Lighthouse, was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was about, I don't know, 300 some feet tall, huge building for, for, you know, in the ancient times. And it only was destroyed, I think, around the year 1500 uh, from an earthquake. And uh, today on the harbor, there's a fort that's there, Fort Katabi. But a lot of the original stones from the lighthouse are still there underwater. And uh, there's a dive shop. And so I went diving and uh, checked out some of the lighthouse of Alexandria, uh, where you can still see some of the original stuff that's there. I did it in February, which, quite frankly, the water was really cold and the visibility was not very good. Uh, you could only see maybe like three feet in front of yourself, but uh, it was interesting. That is interesting. And that is a very old lighthouse too. That's, do you, do you, do you know much of the history of it? Like, yeah. um, was it just uh, oil or what did they use for the light? Wood. Wood. No way. Yeah. And then they had a bronze uh, reflector at the top and uh, that's how people would find their way to the Harbor. Um, it was, there's a, a lighthouse in Spain, which is actually one of the oldest standing Roman buildings. It's actually in really good, it's not, it wasn't as big as the Lighthouse of Alexandria, but it's kind of similar uh, that you can still see today near the Pillars of Hercules. And uh, that's, like I said, in, in southern Spain. So if you wanted an idea, you can at least look at a photo online. But uh, yeah, Alexandria, you know, uh, just before I would say Rome around the year one uh, became the biggest city in the world, Alexandria was the most important city probably in the Mediterranean and the biggest city in the world for a period of time, which is all the more fascinating because, you know, it was a created city uh, by Alexander the Great. The, the amount of history, when I was in Egypt, one of the things that blew my mind was the fact that, you know, with it, what is history to us is, how do I say this? <laughs> Egypt just has such ancient history that um, what we consider history, even back, you know, in, in um, the early parts of, uh, you know, the 1000 AD, whatever, um, they still had history predating that just absolutely insane how far back it goes and how much history um, has happened there in Egypt and in that whole Middle East area. Americans have a very short time horizon uh, because our history isn't that much. There's a good, good saying, 100 years is a long time to an American and 100 miles is a long way for a European. Um, that our, our, yeah. our concept of distance is very different than a European. You know, I, I remember talking to people from the UK and, you know, going from London to like Glasgow. Oh, that was just like the, the, the biggest thing in the world. Whereas I'm a three hour drive from Chicago. I could, I could do it, you know, wouldn't be not something I do every day, but not a problem. Uh, I've done drives, you know, basically crossing the country. I've done that several times over. Um, uh, but in Europe, they think at a, they think at a smaller scale, I think geographically, because it's more densely populated, you have more stuff in a small area, uh, but they have a much longer history. It's, it's not uncommon at all for people to live in buildings that were built in the 17th century. You know, all over Europe, yeah. you'll find stuff that old. You'll never find that. You know, maybe I think there are some, some parts of Boston that are that old, and that's it. Uh, everything else, and most stuff is brand, brand new. Like most of Los Angeles was built after World War II, and that's one of the biggest cities in the world. So, yeah, it, it all depends on your perspective. Yeah, and another thing I, that caught my eye was you experienced the Holy Week in Jerusalem. Um, that is 
crazy to me because that is a very religion is also fascinating you know depending on where you go around the world everybody has their own religious beliefs and how strong they are and how they in, incorporate it into culture um so tell me about experiencing holy week in jerusalem i didn't plan it it just worked out that way uh it crossed the border from aqaba to elat which was an interesting experience because i did it on foot um and then I was in a lot of few days, uh, went to Ein Gedi down near the Dead Sea, and then I was in Jerusalem. And then I, when I was in Jerusalem, I'm like, Easter's next week. I should just stick around. And uh, so I did. And it was a really interesting experience. I went to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher on uh, Easter morning. I should say Western Easter morning, not Orthodox Easter morning, which is a week apart usually. Um the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a absolutely fascinating building. Uh, I did a podcast episode on it actually a while back. Uh, hmm. was there for Passover as well. That was fascinating. Uh, you know, not Jewish, so just, just learning about a lot of the things uh, that, you know, were, were part of that. Seeing how it was held socially. There are some very observant Jewish parts of Israel, especially around Jerusalem. And then when you get to like Tel Aviv, people really aren't observant at all. And so there's very differences in how even like uh, certain restaurants, fast food restaurants, will handle Passover. Um, yeah, it was just a real eye-opening experience. And even one thing I was when I was in Israel, I went to this restaurant that was on the beach in Tel Aviv, and uh, it was an American-style barbecue-type place, sports bar. And uh, like all the wait staff were American, and I saw on the on the menu that they had ribs, pork ribs. Muslims don't eat pork. Jews aren't supposed to eat pork. You cannot import pork into Israel. So for years, I had this nagging question, where did the pork come from? How are they bringing pork into Israel? And it was years later, I found out the answer to the question because I had brought this up to someone. Palestinian Christian farmers who raise what very limited amount of pork demand there is, uh, that's where it comes from. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that is hilarious. Who would who would have thought? And I, now I'm curious to actually go visit one of these farms or to find out like who's who's actually raising it. Because they may they right. must have a host of problems uh, <laughs> you know, doing this. Yeah, I can only imagine. That's so interesting. Which just goes to show, like, you know, what's easy in one part of the world can be very complex and difficult in a different yeah. part. <laughs> well, I I don't wanna I don't wanna go more than too much more than an hour. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. And I always end my episodes with a travel trivia section. And now it's time for travel trivia. Travel trivia coming your way. So first question, what is your favorite city that you visited? Oh, boy. I know that I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna, ter it's a terrible question. I'll go with Singapore. I have always enjoyed Singapore. It's very clean, very nice, but it's also become very expensive. And unfortunately, most of the best cities in the world are also very expensive. Uh, but I like Singapore, and, and it's a great city for food as well. The hawker stands are... Uh, something that is very unique in Singapore, and uh, you can find great food in almost every neighborhood. Nice. If you could, or if you had to, live anywhere in the world permanently, where would you want to live? Like a city or a country? or It could be. I leave it undefined. So you could say a country or a city or a continent. Uh, the Western Hemisphere? No, I'll go with the Northern Hemisphere. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, it's becoming more and more irrelevant for a lot of things uh, for two major reasons. One is like, if you lived in the sticks in the United States uh, with Amazon, you can get stuff delivered to you no problem. I remember visiting a tiny little fishing village in Alaska called Elfin Cove, and everyone in that community relied on Amazon. Everyone had Amazon Prime, and they relied on the shipping. Uh, and that, that community, uh, it's hurt a lot of the local stores, but it's allowed people to live there. And the other thing that's changing, then that's 
going to have huge implications in the next few years is Starlink. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with it, but yep. satellite internet, good internet, you know, several hundred megabits per second, low latency internet. And I've been paying a lot of attention to this is going to radically change everything. You're going to be able to have, you're going to, I, I think you're going to be able to be on a ship. I hate flying. You know, travel is not something you probably want to do if you hate flying, but I hate really long flights. <laughs> I hate crossing the ocean. It's one reason I always like stopping in Iceland if I'm going to Europe, because I'd rather break it up and, you know, do something like that. But if I could, I would rather take a ship to Europe than fly. But mm -hmm. that's not really an option. Cunard does have transoceanic voyages that they do, but they treat it like it's a, you know, a thing. Like, so they take longer than normal. But if you had several hundred megabit connection on a ship and you could work on the ship and you could arrive with no jet lag, think about the worst cabin you're going to get on a ship and compare that to a lay down seat in business class. The worst cabin is better than business class, right? You, yeah. you get a bed, you can nap, you, the food way better on a ship than it's going to be on a, a plane. You, you have a shower all sorts of stuff. And no, it's not for everyone. Obviously, a lot of people are not going to have uh, three or four days to cross the ocean. But if you do have that time, or you can work remotely, I would totally do that. I totally, totally, totally. Absolutely. And Starlink will help make that possible. Where if you could be on the ship, work remotely, do your Zoom calls, stream a Netflix video, and basically you know, be connected as if you're at home, talk to people, then it, it, it completely changes everything. And I'm hoping that that might happen in the future, which doesn't answer your question at all. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, no, I, 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 think the... I love that tangent, though, um, because I, I've been very curious to watch what will happen. Like you said, yeah, it'll rub, it. It's kind of one of those big things like computers and the Internet. I really I really believe I think it'll transform <sighs> how we can. Um, work remotely and the vast majority of people will not be starling customers because you can't really use it in a city there's no need for it in a city mm -hmm. but once you get out of a city you can put it on an rv you can put it on an airplane you can put it on a ship and yeah i know there's there's wi-fi in a plane but it's bad uh this is going to yeah. be radically different and uh it's gonna it's gonna change a lot i don't even think the the airplane Wi-Fi is really going to be the dramatic element of it. It's the fact that you're going to be able to be on an island or a remote yeah. community of indigenous people in northern Canada or Alaska are going to be able to uh, have lectures from teachers that they otherwise could never fly out to this village or do telemedicine and have meetings with a doctor over a 4K video. That's that's huge. That's really game-changing. And... Uh, you know, it's they're 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 almost done with their first uh, orbital shell of sixteen hundred satellites, and they've put more satellites into orbit than all other satellites by everyone else in world history combined. Just to put yeah, that that's into the other perspective, thing, the sheer yeah, I was gonna say just the sheer amount. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that answered my question that you'll never have to live anywhere permanently. So the question's pointless. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it just changes because, you know, when I started, I had to go in 2007, I had to go to internet cafes for a lot of stuff because there wasn't Wi-Fi in yeah. a lot of places or it was bad. Well, now with cellular roaming, that that does, you can either get a SIM card or they have, you know, plans like T-Mobile in the U.S. where you can roam. You know, on, be, staying online as you travel has become super easy to do, and it's only going to get easier and better uh, with the things that are happening uh, in the very near future. I mean, this this is happening right now. So you, it doesn't yeah. matter where you live almost. As they say, history is being made, folks. Next question. What is the worst food that you've ever tried? I don't know if it counts as a food, but I was in <laughs> Haiti and they were distilling rum at this like backcountry distillery we stopped at. And they gave me some to taste, and I spit it out immediately. It was the most god-awful thing I've ever put in my mouth. It was like drinking gasoline. Um, there are some very good rums that come out of Haiti. This was not it. This was like, 
there's a distilling process. You know, this was distilled once. It hadn't been filtered. It, you know, you the only way you get an appreciation for how they actually manufacture some of these spirits is to taste it when it nothing none of this has been done. And it was so so bad. Um, yeah, just just horrible. Man, I could only imagine. So this next question I always like to ask because it, it tells us a little bit about the guest, um, but you've already answered it as far as the, um, yeah, flying long distances across the ocean. But if you have something else, this is the question. If you could change one thing about travel, what would it be? Oh, boy. Um, I'd kill social media. Let me let me actually give you an, in 2009 when I was in Jerusalem, I go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There's a bunch of pilgrims there, uh, visiting the church, praying. I returned a few years ago. Completely different experience. Everyone had a phone in front of their face. Every like everyone, and just everyone. That's all they were focused on was taking pictures of everything. And I see this now everywhere I go. Uh, People are walking off cliffs in some cases because they're not paying attention to where they're going or they're trying to get a selfie, <clears throat> which is tragic, but I also kind of view it as natural selection. Um, this is, yeah, it, I, I don't have a problem with smartphones. I obviously have one, but I do believe that people are, are letting this the selfies and uh, having to show this to their friends get in the way. I always wonder if, if these people are like, yeah, I was just in Paris. And people are like, you liar. You didn't go to Paris. Prove it, you liar. Liar. It's like, oh, no, no, no. I have a selfie of me there. Oh, okay. Man, I thought you were lying for a moment, but but now you proved it. Okay. Pick certain and it happened. <laughs> but no, it's just, and I, you know, especially with some tourists, it's like they literally, they go to some scenic viewpoint, they, they take their picture, and then they leave immediately. It's like their only purpose of traveling thousands of miles was to get their picture taken in front of this thing, not to actually take a picture of the thing, but to take a picture of themselves in front of the thing, and that was it. And it's more just like a status thing, I think, where the same reason people buy certain luxury brands, it's, it, it's not because the brands are better, it's to impress other people. It's to increase your status amongst them. And I, I sadly think that's why a lot of these people travel. They're, they're not, again, there's no intellectual curiosity going on. It is simply done to raise their status with their friends and other people that they can show off to and say, I went to this place. Yeah, I, I can't add anything more to that. All right. Do you prefer to travel by train or bus? That depends on what country I'm in. Normally, Ooh. I would say train unless it's the United States and Amtrak is just awful. It, Amtrak is fine in some places. If you're going in the, the, in the Northeast from Washington to say Boston, it's fine. Chicago to Milwaukee is fine. Um, there are stretches like that. But when I first started traveling, like the very first leg of my trip, I went from Dallas to Los Angeles on Amtrak and it was horrible. Uh, it was as expensive as flying, as long as driving, very uncomfortable, toilet backed up. And I've never, uh, like I said, I think I went from Milwaukee to Chicago once, which is like a 90-minute trip, which is no big deal. Other than that, uh, I have no desire to take a train anywhere in the United States because it's it's really a horrible experience, and people mainly do it, I think, for sightseeing. I would much rather rent a car or drive than take a train in the U.S., yeah. Do you prefer beaches or cities? Sitting on the beach in and of itself does nothing for me. I like the ocean. I like being next to the ocean. But the idea of just sitting on a beach and like reading a book or something, I, I, I'll be bored to tears. Uh, and it also depends on the city. And there's some piece of crap cities <laughs> in the world yeah. that are not very interesting. <laughs> and there are some cities that are great. Uh, so it really depends. But that being said, I, I, I really like being next to water. I've been to a lot of island countries, um, but it's not because, you know, I'm usually I'll go scuba diving or something like that. I'm not necessarily, and I'll go, I was in Tuvalu a couple years ago for four days, which is about the maximum amount of time you want to stay in Tuvalu. And, uh, you know, I would go down to the, the beach, uh, twice a day and just swim. 
I'd swim for 15 minutes and then I'd, I'd go back. But I didn't just sit on the beach. So kind of a cheesy answer, but. No, I like it. Um, it wherever there's stuff to explore and, and uh, um, spark that curiosity. <laughs> Do you prefer solo travel or group travel? Uh, solo. That's a no brainer. There's Do some you places you, uh, you can't travel solo. Like you can't go to Antarctica that way. There are some places you have to go on a group and, and that's fine. And I, and I've done, you know, many group trips and I don't, I'm not against it. Uh, mm -hmm. but all things being equal, I would prefer to travel by myself. Yeah. Uh, would you rather do deep ocean diving or mountain climbing? Uh, define deep ocean diving. Like, because there's a recreational limit to like 40 meters that that's yeah. as deep as you can go. More, more like, uh, yeah. Taking a submarine even. Man, I actually, I'd never had to define this question. <laughs> well, I don't know. If it was just diving Basically versus like mountain climbing. Diving. Yeah. So I've done like 120 dives. Um, I, I enjoy scuba diving and I have no desire to climb Mount Everest. None. Zero. Um, I know some extreme travelers. It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go climb every mountain peak. I'm like, you do that because there's a five to 10% chance you're going to die. And depending on what peak you want to do at what time of year. I have no desire to do that. I would much rather look at Mount Denali and take a picture of it than climb it. I just have never understood the whole mountain climbing thing. Uh, maybe someday I would like to hike up Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is not a technical climb. It's basically just a, a multi-day hike. Uh, and you got to deal with the, you know, the atmosphere. Uh, but all things being equal. Uh, yeah, so you can go. I've been to like 45 meters which is really kind of pushing it as far as how deep you want to go. I did that in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Uh, but that's wow. that's as far as you usually won't go. And the only reason we did that is because there were these specific pygmy seahorses that we had to go down that far to see. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> um, do you prefer a strict schedule or go with the flow when you travel? I make shit up as I go all the time. I never have a schedule. <laughs> Uh, my last international trip I took was in February 2020. I was in Portugal. I was there for uh, an event. And after the event, I gave myself uh, 10 days. And I didn't know what I was going to do. Even the morning I was, the, the conference was over, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to maybe fly to the Azores or Canary Islands or rent a car and drive around Portugal. And I ended up just bopping around Portugal. I had no plan. I just kind of made it up as I went along. I love it. And then we might have we might have already answered this question, but this is the question I always end uh, each episode with: What makes travel worth it to you personally? Learning, learning about new things. Uh, every place you go, you learn about something new, and you also get to connect the dots, understanding what those things have in common, the way they're different. Uh, so the more you travel, it's not like you're you're learning in a linear fashion. It actually is more almost exponential absolutely well gary thank you so much for coming on i have absolutely loved this and uh yeah i just appreciate hearing your perspectives and hearing all the stories that you've uh, shared with us so thanks thanks for coming on the podcast thanks for having me on your show thank you for being a part of today's conversation if you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast and come find us on social media at Travel Worth Living. This episode was edited and produced by Agnes Gretostotter with music by Vlad Glushenko. I'm your host, Seth Sutherland, and this is Travel Worth Living. <laughs>